Flashback 9.2 Friends, Strangers, and Threats Katie was laughing and having a good time, spending a carefree moment in the paver-stoned, outside makeshift food court with the kind man from Graphene Labs, from shipping and receiving. They were eating dogs, fries, and fish and chips, and sharing silly stories far away from their current realities. Out of nowhere, Taylor walked up to Edward and Katie. Where were you? I was looking all over for you. Edward piped up. She was with me. She fell off a curb. I helped her here. I'm sorry, I did not know you were around or I would have helped to try find you. Taylor knew where Katie was all the time. She had been watching from a distance, but now that they were settled under the tree like two little lovebirds, she intended to ingratiate herself into the scene. She said, no worries, um, then she alluded to not knowing his name, to which he replied, Edward. Katie smiled. Edward and I are going to go on a date tonight. Since I'm hurt, would you help me get there, Taylor? Katie turned to Edward. And, um, Edward, would you mind if she came along with us? We came to Prague together, and it won't stop me from getting to know you. Katie played a little bit with her hair and tilted her head to draw his attention into her pretty features and face. Edward smiled. Uh, an afternoon with two beautiful ladies, you got it. I can't do dinner though, I can do afternoon. I'm so lucky man, see you an hour, maybe 2.30 here, yeah? Katie nodded. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, please hurry. It'll be so boring here waiting without you. Katie and Taylor finished their snack lunches and Edward returned to his job. Katie and Taylor remained at the Graphene Labs tree by the paver stone food court lot, so they were always present for whenever Edward might eventually return. And return he did. Edward approached with Katie seated on the grass beneath the tree and Taylor leaned up against it. I have a car, Edward said excitedly. We can take it to a nice restaurant, okay? Katie said, that sounds perfect. Could you help me walk to your car? I'm still hurting from the sprain. Of course, answered Edward. He loved another excuse to hold Katie close to his body. He was very attracted to her. And she gave him many signals to be attracted to her. She was working him and she seemed very good at it. Presumably from her experience as a waitress for years on end, maximizing tips and positive reviews. She was a master of flirtation. Edward took the driver's seat. Katie took the passenger seat next to Edward and Taylor sat behind Edward in the back seat. Edward started the car, but before he could switch into gear to drive, Taylor held a knife from behind the seat under Edward's throat and she said in a slow, clear sentence, listen to me, follow directions or you will die. Got it? Katie looked horrified. Deputy, what are you doing? He's nice, he's a good guy. She started to tear up and cry immediately. What are you doing? Taylor replied, we need to get inside graphene, and we are going to get inside graphene at all costs. She emphasized, at all costs, by pressing the edge of her knife against Edward's throat. Edward was terrorized. He believed that he may well die any moment, but he struggled to remain calm and in control on the outside. He said, trying to be calm. Hey, I just wanted to hang out with a pretty girl. I'm sorry, it was my mistake. You can let me go. I already forgot whatever you think I saw or whatever happened. Taylor shifted her focus back to Edward. Sure, 
you wanted to date Katie. And no, you are not going anywhere. Now, drive us out of here, slow and normal. Head to the restaurant that you had in mind. We will make a detour before we get there. I will let you know when and where we'll go then too. She asserted, here's the deal. We are on a secret mission, which means we cannot tell you anything about it. We need to get inside your company. We need to access your cloud using your computer terminals inside. We need to search for key research throughout the building, and then we need to get out. To do all of that, we need your building security access, and ideally a current floor plan with security information like where there are badge electronic e-locked doors or bio-locked fingerprint retina scan doors, saliva doors, cameras. You get the idea. It's that simple. She then added, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to kill you. But I will do both and in that order if I must to complete my mission. Understand? Edward gulped. Okay, okay, just take my badge. She'll get you inside everywhere. I'm like a janitor. Shipping guys can go anywhere, everywhere in the building. We are not bigwigs, but we got bigwig security. And I'm shipping receiving, so I'm like a shipping bigwig guy. You know, it means I go all over the building with my universal access. You got what you wanted. Here, just take it. Edward handed his badge up to Katie and exhaled and gasped as he spoke. I don't want to die. I give you anything you want. I, I will tell you anything you want. Just tell me, I'll tell you. Katie's heart sank. Her plan to secure Edward's help through kind and warm engagement was twisted into a kidnapping and a threat of murder. She imagined things were going to be so much easier and smoother and kinder and gentler, but the best laid plans rarely survive contact with the enemy. Katie had not considered what Taylor might do in a critical moment like they were in. She had not conceived that soldier Taylor would make a tactical decision in the moment to seize the objective ID and security badge by force at knife point and to subsequently neutralize future threat from the target by sticking him under Tiny's guard locked in the black opaque van with him. No, Katie had not conceived what Taylor might do. Katie also did not inform Taylor of her plan either. So Katie recognized that she was also to blame for the situation as much as Taylor was. Katie failed to communicate her nonviolent plan and so Taylor defaulted to her standard tactics of aggressive resolution. Katie prayed silently. God, forgive me. Forgive us all, for we have sinned and continue to sin in your name, O oh Father. But I am in doubt. I am unsure if I am doing the right things. Please, Lord, guide me. Give me, give us the wisdom and the insight to pursue and do only the right things. Her eyes wet without control. She could not withhold the overwhelming emotion. Tears broke through. Deputy Taylor, seeing Katie beginning to melt down and spiral emotionally, turned to her and said, Katie, it's hard. This is all hard. We must be strong. We can talk things through later. Right now, head in the game. Our lives depend on it. 
She punctuated with a knowing and powerful nod to Katie. The deputy asked Katie to call and coordinate with Tiny to rendezvous with them behind the supermarket, a public place few people would be at, or therefore see us. Edward parked alongside a dumpster and Tiny's black government van with the blazing taxi's logo plastered across it. Taylor said firmly to Edward, We can't have you come with us, and we can't have you running free, telling people about us. So, like Katie mentioned, you are going to sit with our friend there in his van with him. He is armed. He will also hurt and kill you if you do not do as you are told. Got it? Edward nodded. Taylor said in reply, Good. You can stay in your car's trunk, if you prefer, but I would choose the company of our friend. You can call him Tiny. Edward said, Tiny, I choose your friend Tiny. Sorry, I don't have a floor plan or anything about the offices, meeting rooms, labs, or doors. I just have just the physical location map thing. Nothing security, no cameras, I'm sorry. Taylor retorted, Fine, we'll handle it without it. She took Edward's company badge and she escorted Edward to Tiny's van. With her knife visibly in hand but obscured by her jacket, so Edward would know that she was still deadly serious and dangerous, but that others would not see her with a weapon. In total, Taylor took Edward's car keys as well as his wallet, ID, company badge, and his belt and shoes. She also retrieved Katie's and her mission's duffel bags and backpacks of gear and clothing from the van's hidden wall locker stashes. Edward looked on in awe at hidden compartments and bags of mysterious things being taken by a terrifying but attractive soldier lady. Safely secured in Tiny's van, under Tiny's guard, Taylor returned to Katie in Edward's car. Soldier Taylor entered the driver's seat of Edward's car and said, We'll be borrowing his car just for a while. He'll be staying with Tiny until we return with his car. She smiled, and we have his belt and shoes to slow him down should he try to escape captivity. Katie looked disgusted. Look, Miss Taylor, I know you're a rock star soldier and some kind of elite everything, and I know my life is very much in your hands a lot and often. But can we try and follow the Ten Commandments at least? I mean, I get there are times that we must steal, deceive, and even kill. Our mission for God. It's that important that we can do those things. But I think there's a nuance and complexity to it. That God will forgive us for transgressions that cannot be avoided. But God will not forgive us for violations that we could have avoided. We are not above God's law. I accept as God's soldiers that we can violate even the Ten Commandments, but only when there is no other choice. That's what I believe and what I hope you and I can do together. Katie implored, can we please? Soldier Taylor's lips tightened as her eyes focused down into Katie's eyes. She looked deep uncomfortably penetrating into Katie. As if to find deep, inward, within her soul, what possessed her to say, so naively put the teen's lives and mission in jeopardy for occasional reduced impact on the enemy or those who are very likely the enemy or associated with the enemy. So Taylor said in response firmly, I get it, Katie. 
You are used to the good guys winning like in the movies and television. Real life and real death are a blink of an eye away. If we spend that moment, that blink of time, assessing whether or not our actions may conflict with our morality, our ethics, our religion, or whatever we think is important, we may die. No, Katie, I swore to protect the team, and I will always protect myself, and I will not pause while I am on a mission. I will not question myself or my purpose or our plans when we're on mission. Katie, I hear you, but no, I do not see your request for elevated morality to be prudent or responsible in the fight to save humanity and ourselves. Katie lamented. Why did you have to take his belt and shoes and wallet? Just so he can't move and walk freely? We just needed his badge, I thought. Taylor replied, Again, without shoes, he cannot walk or run. At least not very fast. And not on painful surfaces. It will slow him down. And without a belt, his pants will slip and fall. It will slow him down. And it will limit his ability to take any sudden action or to take fight. Never mind that a belt could be used as a strangling garrote, a fist cudgel, or a weak whip or flail. You see, Katie, we did nothing that we did not have to do. We are the good guys, even if we are using fire ourselves at times to fight evil's fire. <laughs>